Welcome Wargamers, my name is Doug with 2 Plus Tough, and today I'm doing one of two videos reviewing my experience at the uh, Vault Wars 22 a tournament that went down in Springfield, Missouri just recently. If you've been following along online through me on Twitter and other uh, social media platforms, you know that I went down there, it was a six hour drive, I brought my buddy Rob, and uh, we just had a fantastic weekend full of meeting awesome gamers, got some great games in. And so the way that I wanted to break up my review of the event is to have one video that's about my personal experience, like going through all five of my games, and then another one talking about the event itself, because if you would like to participate in this next year or in further years, you get a sense of what it's actually like, because it is very different from other events that I've been to. So this video, it's gonna be all about my personal experience and, and really focused more on the games rather than you know anything else like the ancillary stuff those will all be covered in the other video but there were a lot of folks following along with my bone splitter progress that have a lot of questions about the games that i played and uh i did better than i thought i would so i want to share that with you as a top level review thinking about my army if you want to see the list and how i intended to run it uh check out this video right here It'll send you back in time to before the event where I'm like going through all the different tactics and stuff like that I have. Uh, and so what I wanted to do, as I said in that video, was, you know, go to the event and then do a follow up to see how all those things actually played out. What I can tell you, though, for the most part is things went exactly as expected. Weirdly, I'd say better than expected. As we'll get to with the games, every single one of my games was exceptionally close. I don't think I was ever more than four victory points off, like in terms of like the VP earned throughout the game. Uh, not so much like the total tournament scores between players and that kind of stuff, but I mean, every single one of them, we were counting down to the wire. In fact, I think all but one of my games went all the way to turn five. Like every every game, again, down to the last round. That being said, I still did walk away with a one and four score, so that you know doesn't help bone splitters in their placings at all. However, I will say one and four does not give you an accurate picture of just how much fun this was and how challenging it was for my opponents, as many of them said. That is to say that I think with some list tweaking and some more practice, I honestly, sincerely believe there's no reason I could not go three and two with this army. Not not this list per se, I think there's a lot of things that when I put it in practice I would change. Uh, we'll get to that at the end of the video, talking about things that I would do different in the future. And also the fact that I was going specifically for the underdog award meant I couldn't use things like Kragnos, uh, which would also be a massive benefit to the army of course. So I guess what I'm saying is I'm happy with my bone splitters, they did better than I expected them to. I thought I was just going to get blown out all five games and then have to like, you know, rely on my points of charisma to like make sure my opponent had fun and laughed a bit that could not be further from the truth we played every single round of just about every uh, match that I had and we were fighting for those VP every single step of the way all that to say bone splitters are pure Warhammer and I love it the fact that I was in it to the last second means if I just practiced more and tweaked a few things as you will see I could I could easily do a better score than one in four. It, it, it would not take much more at all. I just needed a, a few more tools in the toolbox that are in the bone splitters thing. I just didn't bring them because I didn't have context for it, but we'll get to that in the future. Let's go talk about these games. My round one opponent, as you know, is Brendan Melnick of the Cubic Shenanigans podcast. This was the grudge match that I made. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I did a video challenging him and he accepted and we, uh, we had a great weekend with this ongoing joke. I have nothing but respect for Brendan and he's the perfect person to, to do grudges and this kind of stuff with because he doesn't like take it too far or get weird with it and that's that's why i like brennan um when in the vault wars format you can bring two lists but you have to choose one when you walk up to the table with your opponent okay so you have to be able to explain all the things that it does for our game uh brennan went with his second list which is dearth you you cowards which unfortunately they didn't they just put it here as list two and i was like oh no the actual list name of the list is dearth you you cowards uh, and we'll go through it here. He has a War Song Revenant with Throne of Vines, a Tree Lord Ancient, a Branch Witch, Spirit of Durthu with all kinds of buffs on him. We'll talk about him. A uh, battle line of 10 Dryads, two units of five Tree Revenants, and a big block of six Kurnoth Hunters with Scythes. Um, and then also an additional Tree Lord with Cogs, Spell Portal, and a Spite Swarm Hive. Uh, he had a, lot, a few drops. Uh, he had what? Yeah, he was at nine drops here. But he did have Hunters of the Heartland, which did come in handy for him. Now, here's the thing. I don't have a ton of pictures of me playing these games. And the reason is 
quite simply, I respect my opponents too much to be on my phone, right? I, I understand that I'm a content creator and you all wanted to see pictures of it. There's tons of pictures from Vault Wars online. I'll share the ones that I have in throughout this video, but I didn't take a ton because first of all, I needed my phone for my rogue idol, you know, cause they don't give you the PDFs for war scrolls easily anymore. And so, and also I just wanted to respect, you know, give them my full attention. So you're not gonna see a lot of pictures, but I will walk you through the events as happened. So just feel free to paint along and hang out. So to put it very briefly, here's what happened against my game with Brennan. Um, the Lord gave me an in and I messed it up. You see, Brennan, uh, he tried doing all of his like spell casting round one and he got like two perils, I believe, uh, or miscast, I guess we want to call them. And then things backfired for him and I was like, oh man, this is the best, this is the best. And then round one, when it was my turn, I chose my battle tactic and then, I don't know if I was just role playing as a bone splitter or what, I got distracted, I did not fulfill it, even though it was right there for me to do. So that was a huge bummer. I totally, I totally missed that tactic and that's what really set the difference because from that point on, I was always like two or three points behind and I just, I needed to get ahead. And that, that seems to be the key with this army is I have to get really, really high on VP as soon as possible and then grind my opponent out and I just missed an opportunity there. Now after that first round his spellcasters started working and I got my head in the game and so it actually ended up being an exceptional game. I think the final score was 19 to 23 and what you know is incredibly close so it's not fair to say like oh I just lost hard. I certainly did not. Uh, in the course of this game I took two nukes from the is it throne of vines is that the spell where it like has like an uh, area of effect that you put it through the portal all kinds of nastiness from there the warsong revenant is one of the coolest minis I, i've never seen him in person before and so it was really really cool to see what he could do i love this list that brennan brought um to put it really simply he used the six kernoth hunters with size as kind of an anchor in the center of the table uh one thing i should point out and I'll do this better at the other uh, rounds, as we were playing um, First Blood. So I'll try to give us a sense of what the mission was like and that kind of thing. That's This is where you have like an L-shaped deployment on your sides, and there's three objectives going diagonally across the table. And uh, essentially he put the Kurnoth Hunters in the dead center one and was just like, come get it. Next to them was a, a Tree Lord who was just there to just be scary, be big, and Durthu, which with all of the buffs and abilities and command traits and junk that he had on him, had this unique ability to strike and then like retreat. He could basically yo-yo Durthu like a madman, and I could not have any of that. He tried wrecking uh, my rogue idol, Pumbaa, and uh, Pumbaa went down to one wound and then just like did not want to die at all. So Pumbaa was still good, and then uh, the Wurgog Prophet moved up. He did his Care Bear Stare, the amazing Wurgog Prophet staring ability. If you have not seen my video on it, please go check it out. But he took out the Tree Lord, uh, the basic tree lord the tree lord ancient was way way back in the table the whole game uh so i took out the tree lord and then my boar boy maniacs the more melee focused of the boar boys went after durthu and they chased him down like they were relentless he no matter how many little you know hit and runs he did they were able to catch up and finally put down Durthu. The Tree Revenants, I did not know that they were only one wound. So every time a pig touched them, like I have my little five man pigs that are like garden objectives and stuff like that. Uh, every time a pig touched those things, they just evaporate. It was it was very nice. So I liked it quite a bit. The Kurnoth Hunters with their ability to plant roots really did. I mean, if my army can't nail something the first charge with mortal wounds and stuff like that, it tends to get really, really bogged down. And so these were no exception. They were a brutal unit to try to have to chew through. Uh, I did in the end, I, I, I believe by the end of the game, he either had one left or I think he took them all off because I think the last round, there was nothing but my guys in the dead center and his spell portal and he did one final nuke. So it was just, it ended up being a crazy close game. It was all about objectives. Uh, we shook hands at the end of four, I believe, because it just reached a point where I was like, okay, well, I don't have an army anymore, so I can't achieve anymore. You know, we sat there together and talked it out. And we're like, is there anything else you think I can do? Walking through all the tactics that I have left. And, it, you know, it just wasn't possible. Like, um, we, you know, did a final turn to, like, move things around so that I could, you know, get um, my grand strategy of having a battle line left alive, that kind of stuff. But for the most part, by round four, uh, his army, all he had left was a Warsong Revenant, uh, 
what is their name? Branch Wraith and I think a few little here odds and ends there. But like there was like six models total on the table. Like it was a good bloody fight. Absolutely awesome. Midway through the game, I feel like, uh, you know, the excitement and, uh, you know, I mentioned before round one, I kind of messed up on my objectives. I think I was just kind of very little overstimulated from meeting so many people that morning. And so like this was a perfect game with someone that I'm comfortable with to kind of nestle into it and so by halfway through the game i got my bearings i chilled out and i was doing exceptionally well but it just wasn't enough to catch up on points and uh yeah brennan took the win so good job buddy you won the grudge match i'll see you again soon but like i said we're keeping tally of the things the wargog prophet killed with his care bear stare this game was a tree lord so that completed round one, we were feeling good, pairings went up, and my heart sank. You see, I was kind of hoping to get beaten by Brennan so that I would be kind of like shoved down with all the other like, not bottom tier players, but armies that aren't there to win, you know, the gold or whatever. Uh, and I ended up playing a list that when I did my list review for the event, I, I just skipped over because I was like, there's no way that I could beat this. And that is the Stormcast Eternals Army by Joe, who's actually up here in the De greater Des Moines area. Uh, and so I'm very excited about that because he's someone who's close enough that I could actually reasonably play again. And he chose his second list. So going through that, uh, this is going to be Stormcast Eternals, Hammers of Sigmar, uh, with Beastmaster as the grand strategy. He had a Lord Relictor with Translocate, a Knight Draconis, who's Master of Magic and has the Arcane Tome, a uh, Lord Celestint on Dracoth. For his battle line, he had four Dracothian Guard Fulminators, five Judicators, and a unit of four Storm Drake Guard. Now, all you know, memes and jokes aside, I was looking at this list like, I don't even, I, what would I do? The only advantage that I have here is board presence, and so I decided to really flex that as much as possible. Our mission was a game of heroes, and I'll try to throw some you know, reference material for that up on the screen here. And, and essentially, turn one, which I got because I had fewer drops than him, uh, I charged the big unit of four dragons and I took one of them off the table, okay? It's so like I had my 10-man unit of basic pigs. They rushed straight forward, charged the unit, and at that point. Now, I think that event kind of put him on tilt a little bit in terms of, like, not being sure of, of what the real threats in my army are. Now, the pigs, they're not scary once they've charged. Once they're in combat, they're, they're just... They do nothing. They fight with pillows. But based on the way that uh, Joe reacted against them... It seems as if he thought that they were going to keep doing that, like keep pulling dragons off and he was going to be stuck in that combat. So he pulled the dragons out of that and then um, brought in his Lord Celestin on Dracoth and he was going to try and kill my general, which is a savage orc boss. He failed to do that. Uh, unfortunately, it was just, just the wrong wrong turn for him he rolled terribly to have that happen uh, and between that and zoning out large portions of the map uh, I was able to kind of address the threats that he was putting to me like the Lord Celestint and the dragons and all these kinds of things one by one and that's like the thing you don't want to do with my army because if you let me dedicate a ton of resources to solve a single problem I can solve it uh, and all that to say that by round I think three when the fulminators came in uh, just in terms of how I zoned the board out with my tiny heroes all having a nine inch, you know, you can't drop down here area. Uh, he put them down in his own deployment zone, which he knew he had to, but didn't want to. And then I had set up two prime targets for him to charge the big block of maniacs, which is super nasty on the charge but also the rogue idol, who he didn't really do a ton of wounds to. I think the turn he really went into the rogue idol, I popped my wah, which gives him a four up ward. Uh, so he can, he can be pretty stinking tanky when he already has a base four up save, four up ward on top of that. So he's he's gross, to, to put it mildly. And uh, I'm, there's one moment of this event that I was very happy with myself because it showed that I do have the ability to plan ahead and set, you know, traps and stuff like that, which I do like. Uh, and it's this shot right here where you can see the Fulminators, there's a unit of Maniacs, and then the Rogue Idol. Whichever one he charges, the other one is going to come around and hurt him. And of course, he could try to charge both. I mean, there's certainly enough base width in the Fulminators unit, but that would just only guarantee that he did nothing to either of them. And so, no matter what he chose, the other threat is going to get him, and then also the big Stabas were there and they just cleaned house. So I was able to uh, table the Stormcast army, 
uh, turn four, I believe. I think I tabled him. Uh, Joe, correct me in the comments if I was wrong about that. Uh, the big takeaway here is the Wurgog Prophet killed the Knight Draconis with his Care Bear Stare. And I was over the moon with that. I mean, and and keep in mind, it wasn't um, it just a matter of like bad, bad play or tactics like that. I mean, Joe's dice, they're just, you know, it's a dice game and his were not with him. <laughs> Like, the amount of fails he rolled for those dragon breath attacks was, uh, I'm gonna say, breathtaking. And uh, it was just, it was a comedy of errors on, on his side in terms of, like, how badly he was rolling combined with, you know, Stormcast just don't have the footprint compared to my block of, you know, 30 wounds and pigs and stuff like that. It's just a lot. And so if you're not constantly rolling at least average when it comes to all your attacks, it, you get swarmed. You get swarmed on objectives, and that's exactly what my list did. All in all, a super fun game. We were laughing a lot because it's just it's, it was just ridiculous. You know, uh, this is my one win of the event. I'll just throw that out there, and uh, it was it was a comical win because of the way that we were using the hunt, which is the modification that certain units give extra vp when you kill them and in certain factions gain additional vp bone splitters being among them so he was giving me victory points left and right and center between the fulminators and the dragons and the knight draconis and all these things it was just it was a flood and so like all my other games were were very very close this one was more of a closeout i mean i, I still had quite a few models on the table even if he had more stuff in reserve um but it was just a funny thing of like, all my scores were super, super close, except for this one, which was like cranked real high, but it had nothing to do with the scenario. It was 100% the hunt. Joe was an awesome opponent and I would absolutely play him again. Uh, the, the models he was putting together were absolutely stunning and I think that he's gonna have a great time with that army once he kind of, uh, I, think, I think there's just something to having, you know, a horde. Like even if it's just allying in a Cities of Sigmar block of 30 dudes, Something with a bit more staying power than um, the Stormcast have right now. So I'm not quite sure. I don't. I don't know enough about that kind of list where you lean so heavily into being elite. Like I don't know. But uh, it was a fun game for sure. If nothing else, I I did something beyond my own expectations. Like I did. I thought I was going to get tabled very very quickly, and I was able to achieve something that I didn't think possible. That's cool. Round three was against John. We were playing Savage Gains for a scenario, and uh, his list to go as a brief rundown here. He had Seraphon, Thunder Lizard. Uh, for his leaders, he had a Stegadon with Skink Chief. It was his general. Uh, he has Prime War Beast as the command trait. Uh, cloak of Feathers, Sky Streak Bow, and the Beastmaster trait. Uh, he also had two Skink Priests, an Engine of the Gods, a Slan Star Master, and an Astrolith Bear. It's a lot of heroes. Uh, for his battle line, he had four units of ten Skinks and two Bastilladons attached on there. Uh, and he also had Chronomatic Cogs. Now, going into this game, I need to be upfront. I was exhausted. This is round three on the first day. Um, I feel like I did a really good job of covering objectives really Really quite well. I went straight for the engine of the gods because I knew that he had the ability to bring new units on the table, specifically Saurus or something like that. And so I made a beeline to pin the engine of the gods there so that even if he rolled well enough to get those units, he had no physical space to bring them on the board because they have to be outside at nine. And so I shut that down very, very well. And he had no teleportation stuff, so I felt very confident about that. Uh, the only issue is, is that my army once it's split up and on the objectives, they just have to be able to stay there and survive. And so I got really, really high on victory points the first, I think, two rounds, three, uh, round three is when it started to even out a bit. Um, his Stegadon with Skink Chief was a murder ball. I mean, like the entire game, that thing, it started on one side of the board and just walked across to the other and was just deleting anything that was in its way. Now, admittedly, I didn't throw like a full, you know, a full health unit directly into it to see what I could do. But with all the buffs and, and that kind of stuff, I mean, even just the, uh, what is it, the Cloak of Feathers, that artifact in and of itself is massively punishing to my army because we don't hit well as it is. It was a very close game because he had to claw back all of the victory points. But uh, in the end, I think it ended up being 24 to 27. Like I'm saying, all of these games are like one 
decent turn away, you know, and I could do it. Uh, if it's not that exact number, it was something very, very close. Uh, cause we were, we were just triple counting all of the things that we had earned to make sure, uh, big highlight here was the word God prophet killed a Bastilladon. <laughs> Um, which was my favorite moment of the, uh, of the prophets killing stuff. Now, as far as, uh, how the game actually went itself, you know, this is one where uh, I kind of feel bad that like, I, you know, when you get super, super tired at a certain point, like when five o'clock hits, you're like, I'm done playing Warhammer. <laughs> And so I didn't I don't feel like I gave John the best game possible like if he had caught me in round two I think I would have had much more mental focus to make better plans and things like that I, I forgot minor things here and there, but it wasn't so much that it was more my attitude And so uh, John it was a wonderful game your seraphon are crazy good uh, and just absolutely punishing That's I mean, I didn't realize that the skink on the uh, the big beastie there the stegodon could be so terrifying and I I love it I love it and I I took a picture here and I'll show it uh, when he was setting up. And the reason I like this list is not because it's highly effective, which it was, it was quite good, but also because it looks like what a Seraphon army is supposed to be. And that got me so excited. There's Skinks, he's bringing in Saurus, which he already plans to. Uh, there's big monsters. He has like his leaders are just wrecking face. It just it looks good. And you know, I love whenever armies look like they should on the box art and stuff like that. And so it made me very happy to play against. I would absolutely play against John again. He was wonderful as an opponent uh, at explaining his rules and, and keeping track of his debuffs on me, which is very, very important. But yes, this one was again another close close loss. Now at the end of round three, pairings went up for the following morning. We went out and had a great time, hung out and got pizza and stuff like that. It was a blast, but we already knew what round four was going to be, and I drew Dan Bears of the Cubic Shenanigan podcast. I got the full tour of my favorite show, so I got to play against Dan, who was a terrific opponent. Um, and kind of, I was thinking about it all night of like, what would I do? Because you'll see he has the Night Haunt list with Nagash in it, and so I was like, well, what am I going to do against this because I felt like one of two things was going to happen. I was going to surge forward and I was either going to make his night haunt part of his army evaporate and then it's just Nagash in front of all these things that can that can mess him up. I mean, they can. Um, just by sheer weight of dice and the mortal wounds that come from being ice bones, he had a good chance. Uh, or, Conversely, the Night Haunt wouldn't evaporate fast enough and Nagash would have his little, you know, wall of bodies and he just shoots me for five rounds. Turns out, the latter happened. But let's check out his list here. So this is Dan's uh, Night Haunt list. We have uh, Rykenor the Grimhaler, and, and uh, it's his procession, the sub-faction here. Um, and he's got a Guardian of Souls with Nightmare Lantern who was... Uh, almost entirely useless the entire game. He miscast the first round, failed two castings after that. <laughs> Dude was having a rough day. He also had a Dreadblade Harrow and Nagash, the Supreme Lord of the Undead, of course. 20 man unit of Chain Rasps, 10, 10, and 10 more Chain Rasp units. That's four units total. One of them is 20, go three or 10. He also had the Mortalis Terminexus Endless Spell, which is way better than I thought it was. I don't know why I don't see enough people talking about it. And then also the Umbral Spell Portal. Now, to put it very simply, I surged forward. I got on the objectives as much as I could. The thing is with my army though, if, if my initial charge doesn't do enough, especially against death armies. Uh, I'm in a really rough place because because I was not able to fully delete even those 10 man units of chain rasps, Nagash's ability to add models back to them meant I didn't kill most of those units the entire game. I mean, I killed the three 10 man units, I believe. There was still at the end of the game, he was still putting models back into that 20 man unit. Uh, and that took time to kill the other three. And so I just was not punching through to his ability objectives as well as I needed to be. Uh, he was able to bring the Dreadblade Harrows into my back line. Um, that was a big deal because I went to go attack him and my I had two uh, savage big bosses on that Dreadblade Harrow and I, they left him with one wound remaining. And that one wound 
was important because it allowed him to then move to another objective and capture that. So it was just a big, a big fluster cluck, shall we call it. He was able to get Hand of Dust off and delete uh, Pumba, my my rogue idol, which was, you know, emotionally devastating, but uh, a good move on his part because I was very aggressive. I, I knew Hand of Dust was definitely a possibility and I'm more than happy to use the rogue idol as a distraction piece. So like, sure. You know, yeah, you spent two spells doing Umbral Spell Portal and then Hand of Dust. That's fine. You've invested in a lot into killing him. And realistically, the real meat of my list comes from the pigs. So you didn't you didn't do anything to them, right? That's two spells that you could have dumped D3 Mortal Wounds from Arcane Bolts into them. You didn't do it. And so I was actually feeling okay about that. Uh, it was more when... Um, I forgot that Nagash was able to uh, fly over terrain simply because uh, Vault Wars does terrain a little bit differently. There's impassable stuff and I misunderstood how impassable works in regards to fly. And so he was able to pop over and he got the charge on my Boar Boy Maniacs who were all lined up to kill Nagash. And I don't think they would have killed him in one round for sure, but they could have definitely bracketed him hard. So getting that charge off and deleting, I think, all but four of them. So, so he took six pigs off of that unit. Uh, it just knocked the wind out of their sails a little bit. And so from there, it was just a hard, hard crawl. Now, that being said, we were still fighting for every single objective. This game went to round five until we just didn't have armies left, right? There was Nagash on the board, sure, um, but he didn't have any army with him to speak of, so it ended up being just Nagash desperately running around trying to catch the objectives up. Uh, and, and in that last turn, Dane was able to, to pull forward just a smidge. So again, another game that came down to the final round. I essentially covered the entire board with my army and then he had to very slowly chip it away off each objective and then of course when I went uh, second in round three I pulled one of his objectives off to make it harder on him so it, it was a constant push and pull like I say it's just exactly what Warhammer should be. Lots of stuff dying, lots of battle happening. The issue was I, he just had recursion. So like I would delete a couple chain rasps and he'd bring them right back. And like once my army loses its initial impetus, it, it just kind of crumbles. And I'm okay with that. That's a fine, you know, strength and weakness. That's totally cool. But in a prolonged combat with a bunch of that, it was just, it was too much to handle. And unfortunately, uh, I took a loss. And again, I don't know if I said it before, that mission was forcing the hand. So Dan, buddy, you crushed it. I've never played against uh, Nagash with my bone splitters for sure. And I think I've only ever played against him once or twice. And it was like years ago at this point. So you did awesome. It was one that I knew it was going to go one of two ways. Either a hard win, hard loss. It ended up being neither. They were very close. We were, we were neck and neck here at the end. Uh, but it ended up being that I just, because I couldn't punch through those chain rasps round one, it put me in a really rough place. And so uh, I think that's kind of what it came down to. Now for my last game, we played focal points in round five. Uh, my opponent was Zaro, who was a insanely kind and, and just really, really nice, sweet guy. Uh, I believe from the St. Louis area, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and he brought his, he had two lists. He brought list number two, which was the Stormcast. It was Knights Excelsior, uh, but an actual, like, I don't know. I love this list for Stormcast. So he has a Lord Imperitant, a Lord Relictor. Those are his heroes. Lord Relictor, of course, has Translocate. For his battle line, because the Knights Excelsior Paladin units are battle line. So he has two units of Annihilators with Meteoric Grand Hammers. So it's just the basic three mans. And then a 10 man unit of protectors with four star soul maces. This can be massive because their footprint of 10 paladins for Stormcast is gross. There was also a 10 man unit of judicators with the Skybolt bow and two storm strike chariots. Uh, as far as core battalions, he had one battle regiment and one thing of hunters of the heartlands. So like I said, we're playing focal points and this mission was, was brutal on both of us. Uh, so I went first and I did exactly what my list does. I went and I scored a whole bunch of objectives. I contested every single one of them and I spread out with my heroes as aggressively as possible and was just very conscious in round one of my movement. And when I did that, I think he, he, he was kind of watching, he was paying attention. He was, he was chatting with some people next to us and just we we're all having a good time. 
you know, movement phase is boring as hell. But then when he looks back at the table for his turn, I think he maybe be like, I don't know, wore a hole or a circle around our table, just constantly walking around it because uh, he, he said multiple times, like, this is the most cerebral game he's had. He's had to do like several laps to try and find any place to bring his units in from the sky. So I, I took that as a really high compliment of like, you know, I, I am good at the fundamentals of Warhammer, which is, you know, how to zone things out and how to basically kind of set the line of engagement. So I felt like I played a very control style with this game, and I think it paid off quite a bit. He just didn't have room to put his units on the table. Nor could he translocate with the 10-man block of protectors. There was no meaningful place to put them. And when I say I zoned him out, I mean uh, he didn't earn a single victory point until round two, and I think it was only three at that point, uh, right? Because it was capture one, and then, yeah, I think he captured two in round two, uh, and then he got a VP for something else. But yeah, I mean, he, he he didn't, he just literally could not do a lot. He tried to, uh, when he did have space to bring his Judicators in, he tried to shoot my Savage Big Boss off, like do Slay the Warlord as a battle tactic. He just didn't have enough killing power to do that. He tried splitting his shots, which was a mistake, but that's okay. Um, but yeah, it was just ended up being a slog. Uh, really what it came down to was not so much the protectors, that's what I was mostly scared of, but the chariots became really really gross again they're not the most crazy damaging things like i i had stormcast chariots i still have them on my shelf like they're they're great units for sure what they really added though was uh their base size when they put that base size down you put some sideways the rogue idol who's on an even bigger oval didn't have the room he needed to navigate so even though i was you know accomplishing my battle tactics and stuff i needed that rogue idol to go in and mess some stuff up and he simply could not reach his targets because I didn't want to get him bogged down in other combats. So that was kind of the trade-off here. And so I was playing a little bit dodgy against the uh, the protectors, but getting pinned down by those chariots was rough. And the mortal wounds that they can put out, you know, bone splitters have a six up save and it's awesome, but uh, yeah, no, it just, there was no contest. So basically how the game went is I surged forward. I took all the objectives and just kept cranking victory points. And again, turn by turn, he had to like never let off the gas pedal and then clawed his way back up to where he beat me, I think by two or three points in the last round. Like it really is that thing. If you go on tilt against my list and you, you know, lose hope and, you know, find despair, you lose the game. But if you can claw every single battle tactic, every single point back out, you can you can you can beat them. Those chariots just wrecked the best parts of my army and because he did translocate, he wasn't just doing it with the judicators, although he did that at one point. Um Really, it was just that my army was getting pulled in too many different directions. Now, it did help me that he would bring down, say, like the Annihilators, and they failed to charge at one point, even with their rerolls, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then I was able to counter charge and delete those. For stuff like broken ranks and battle tactics like that, it was very nice for me to only have to worry about nine wounds. But uh, in terms of like fighting the big block of protectors that went on one objective and the chariots that doubled up on another, there was just not a lot I could do. And then I was getting peppered and shot off by uh, adjudicators. And, it, you know, it ended up being just a phenomenal game. It was one of those games, I actually have my notes here in all caps, best game. Because when I think about how people at Warhammer, or Games Workshop rather, imagine these games being played when they make battle tomes. I think when they think of Stormcast versus Orcs, this is the exact game in their mind. Every single turn was a matter of uh, movement, of spacing out your opponent, capturing objectives. Like there was no part of this game that was not highly tactical, that it could have gone either way. Uh, Zaro, when, he, when we rolled for round five, um, priority he he won it and he just stopped everything and pointed at the die he was like this is this is why i win like this is the only reason i'm winning this game right now because if i had won it i could have um, outnumbered him enough with heroes and stuff like that because i have so many of these stupid savage big bosses where i could have but it came down to round five priority dice roll and you know i can't ask for anything more for my games for that so final thoughts on um the vault wars experience and what i want to do with my list going forward so the games were awesome um i know that saying i went one in four is not brag worthy <laughs> you know there was some people joking around like hey 
did you beat Doug? You know, all that kind of stuff, like, to my opponents. And uh, Zaro was trying to be very, very humble and was like, yeah, yeah, I bet him. And then people were like, no, don't be don't be humble. You beat a YouTuber, all kind of stuff. I was like, yeah, go. You you go on to the Honest Wargamer forum and brag about beating a Bone Splitters player. Let's see how many, you know, high fives you get. Not many. But I will say that, uh, first of all, I felt like the army did consistently better than what the internet told me it would be like. By that I mean, you'll hear a lot of people talking about, you know, how effective an army is or how good it can be, uh, and, and what you read online would lead you to believe that bone splitters, by taking them, are an auto-lose. And I gotta say there's nothing further from the truth. Every single one of my games was so close, if I hadn't have, if I wasn't in a weird headspace round one, I do believe I could have beaten Brendan, and I think he would agree with that. I mean, I just missed my battle tactics. It is what it is. Um, for the other games, all of them were so stinking close. Uh, the the round two, when I beat the Stormcast, uh, with all the Drakes and the Fulminators, that was completely, that was something I, that was beyond what I thought possible, uh, which is a weird achievement. For the other games, like, I'm gonna be looking at modifying my list a bit. I loved playing the bone splitters. I had more fun with these bone splitters than I did with my maggot kin when I was going to events or at any point with my stormcast. And the reason is I like speed and I like board control. And these this army gives me that. And I think I can do more with those things. Like there were just some tools that I didn't have access to that I wanted. So like, for example, in the list that I brought, because I was netlisting and I've, I've never tried to hide that fact, I went onto a Bone Splitters tactic site, found a pre-made list that said it didn't well, boom, I took that one. What I found was I wouldn't mind dropping the Maniac Weird Knob and perhaps the Big Stabas to put something else in there. Perhaps even, I dare say, Arrow Boys simply because they do offer some ranged threat. There were at least three times in this event where I was like, you know what I just need? Either a bunch of bodies of losers to sit on an objective, which Arrow Boys can certainly do, but then also I, I just need to plink one wound off a guy. Like, but he's 12 inches away, so I can't reach him. Well, it gives me some options, you know? And so it's one of those things, is, is it gonna be a unit that's useful? No, they're not long strikes, but they're not trying to be. They're just offering something in terms of range support, which I believe could be very helpful for the list. I wanna experiment with that, I already own them, so it's like, I got nothing to lose by trying, we'll do that. Uh, one other thing I wanted to do was check out Kragnos. Now, Kragnos, the only reason I didn't have him at this event was because, like I said, I'm going for the underdog award, and you can't do that if you have a god tier character in your list. So. So that was the big reason. But going to other events where that that award does not exist, I would definitely take them. My most valuable player for sure was the 10 man block of Maniacs on Boars because people, you know, and I, I, I did explain to my opponents, like there's two different kinds of orcs on Boars here. There's the spear guys and the double hand weapons. They function differently. Right, They're, it's it's not like just a different weapon profile. The, the spear orcs, if you don't know, who are on pigs, they get plus one to hit and wound when they charge, assuming they have the spears. Um, the other ones, the maniacs, get plus one to their attacks. So let's just think about that for a second. You already have buckets of attacks and on the charge they just roll buckets more and those buckets explode on sixes to hit and they do mortal wounds uh, on a wound roll of a six. So it just ends up that they can swing way above their weight class, even though they look aesthetically just like everybody else in the army. The rogue idol was phenomenal. Uh, it either worked as a great distraction piece or in the case of my game against Stormcast, where if they left him alone, too long, he made it up the board, he ruined some days. So I'm gonna keep iterating with the list. I wanna try a few different types of units, maybe even some allies, things like that. I have to say it was a great event for learning the strengths and weaknesses of it because of the just variety of lists I played, right? I mean, you got Sylvaneth, uh, a very elite version of Stormcast, Seraphon, Nagash with Night Haunt and a very different kind of Stormcast from the other one. But like, those are five very different types of armies and I felt like I had a game in each and every one of them. So look forward to more Bone Splitters related content as I lead up to other events. I wanna say a huge thank you to each and every one of my opponents. Everyone was so nice and so kind. Even John, when I was on my round three, end of the day, just like slog and all I wanted to do was drink water and go to bed. He was nothing but an outstanding gentleman and and uh, I had a wonderful time, and I uh, hope that all my opponents had a good time playing against me. I can say this, I 
I'm excited for Vault Wars 23. Uh, I know it's going to be even bigger, better, and smoother as an event, just because you know it's everyone gets a first pass at running an event and having you know having to work out the kinks. They did a stellar job. Everything was so clean and neat and timely. Uh, we always knew who our opponents were. If there was any issues, the TOs were always available. And uh, overall, it just seemed like a fantastic weekend of gaming. Certainly for me, I can vouch for that, but for everybody else as well. So friends, if you have any further questions about how the event went in terms of how I played, uh, go ahead and leave those here. And there's going to be a sister video talking about the event itself, capital E event, how it was run, the tables and all that kind of stuff, uh, which will be going out very, very soon. Thank you all so much for watching and listening, and I'll catch you next time. Happy Wargaming.